Hey folks, as promised here with Franklin Horton for our first uh, authors interviewing authors kind of series. And uh, Franklin, good morning. Welcome uh, from uh, the uh, communist state of Virginia. <laughs> That's why we call it the communist wealth instead of the commonwealth. <laughs> exactly. I'm just surprised you guys haven't had like radical gun confiscation stuff pop up, you know, in the midst of all this, but... Well, you know, I'm only 25 minutes from the Tennessee border, so I can make a break for it if I have to. Come on over. <laughs> I need you. I'll stop at the first rest area on the Tennessee side and make my stand. There you go. Yeah. Squatter's rights if you stay there long enough. Um, but, yeah, come on over. The water's fine. No taxes. <laughs> but, Freedom. <laughs> yeah. I'll take it. Especially up here where I'm at. We don't even have building codes. Just us and the Amish and the other gun nuts. But, uh, so, anyway, uh, before we get to the questions, you know, the first thing we were going to do is we were going to talk about, you know, what you see going on in your area, what you think about the things that are going on, what your feelings, what your observations, you know, and uh, so go ahead, lead, lead off with that. Well, you know, my area is very similar to where you live. You know, I'm, I don't live in a town. I live in a farming community, I guess. You know, I live in a field between towns. So uh, we, you know, there's a lot of things that are missing from the grocery stores. But for the most part, people are just behaving normally. Uh Farmers are still farming. I'm hearing chainsaws every day. I'm hearing gunshots every day. So all my neighbors are still living their lives and doing their regular thing. And, you know, I guess one of the first things I'd say is there are some people that are absolutely paralyzed by this. I, I hear from people who are, you know, crying and just flipping out. And, you know, you still got to live your life because, in the end, it doesn't matter if this is a Chinese bioweapon or if this is a, a Middle Eastern bioweapon or if this is a, a engineered virus or if it's just some natural thing that came from, you know, the Wuhan market. Uh, I can't control that. My preparations and the way that we live here is going to be the same either way. So, you know, I don't see myself getting real wound up about the aspects of it that I can't control. Because, you know, in the end, if you're preparing to for whatever event and you're preparing to handle a pandemic or, you know, a virus or whatever, on my end, the preparation is kind of the same. So I'm not going to get wound up about the parts of it that I can't control. I'm just going to try to, you know, us live our basic daily lives. We are not going anywhere. We're staying here on the farm, but you know, it's a good time to do things. There's always stuff on the farm that needs done. And now my kids can't go to school. So they're home and I can enlist them and turn them into loggers and gardeners and all those other things. So, you know, uh, <coughs> we're, still getting by and that's the one thing i would urge people not to do is not to get wound up about the parts of it you can't control keep going i'm glad you mentioned that you know one of the things that's been driving me nuts is you know how we've been politically divided over the past few years and to where anyone with an opposing opinion you're supposed to instantly chastise them and hate them and it almost seems like this virus is creating that same emotion if if i post something online that other people don't agree with they don't necessarily agree with my take they're offended by it you know and if other if like if if you're if one person is listening to a uh, a group of highly educated professionals that say this is what it is and someone else disagrees with that or just has you know maybe doubts that you know something just doesn't feel right you know that kind of crowd uh the the, the, the groups are at odds with each other they're, they're getting mad at each other and fighting with each other over whose who's opinion is right and whose opinion is wrong. Well, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if somebody else disagrees with you. Whatever that reality is, is eventually going to smash you in the face with you, whether you agree with a certain point of view or not. So the only thing you can do is, like you said, be prepared. Whatever comes, comes. And why sit here and argue with each other and let this divide grow even wider? Yeah, because this is not causing uh, a division any more between liberals and conservatives or preppers and non-preppers. This is splitting apart 
the preparedness community because you've got some people who are like, I will not be wound up by the media. Well, regardless of whether you're not going to be wound up by the media or not, the, this virus is still spreading and you still need to be cautious. I'm not going to go out there and get it out of spite, you know, just to show the media, you know, that they're not winding me up. So, you know, I don't think that we should let ourselves be divided because, you know, a lot of the stories and the, uh, the things that you see being circulated are either years old or they come from some questionable source. It's probably some Chinese teenager making this up just to see if he can troll people, you know? Yeah. Yes. I, I think we, we definitely all need to just, just chill on our attitudes and opinions because it's moot. They don't matter. You know, they don't matter. What's going to happen is going to happen, you know, and me disagreeing with you over your stance, what's that, what's that accomplish? You know, you, if, if you have a certain theory as to, as to how this all came about and I disagree with that, why is getting mad at you over it going to solve anything? You know, it's like we're trained to be divided now. And it's just going to tear, like you said, tear the preparedness community apart. People that may have used to have been assets, people are going to get hard feelings with over it because they don't see the conspiracy exactly the way I do or they don't agree with the expert that I agree with. All that stuff's irrelevant. What's going to happen is going to happen, whether you agree with it or not. Yeah, and that's one of the basic uh, principles I see anyway of, of being prepared is that you, you know, regardless of what, source it's coming from regardless of whether it's an ice storm a pandemic or whatever you know you've kind of got to have a basic level of preparedness and you've kind of got to be committed to i'm going to focus on my family the people i care about and my little area that here that i can control and i'm not going to get wound up because you know it's like those things you you get i get these through email all the time somebody saying Trump is just a tool of the Rothschilds, you know, and, and Biden is a tool of Soros. But in the end, I can't control that. You know, that is so far beyond my sphere that it doesn't matter who's winding up Trump and who's winding up Biden. I can't control that. And it's not going to affect on the personal level what I do here. Exactly. Exactly. We, we should all have our own. Pay, we should try to pay attention. We should try to form our own opinions, but we shouldn't let that let that divide us like it is. Uh, I agree, hundred percent. You, you brought up an interesting point a minute ago that kind of reminded me of of your first book. You know, I'm going to control what I can control here with my family, and that's kind of the theme that got you started with the borrowed world. So I know the borrowed world isn't necessarily about uh, a, a viral outbreak or a pandemic or something like that, but uh, tell us how the things your main character does in that book could tie into a situation like this and also with lock and nine <clears throat> well you know with that first book that was and this kind of addresses one of the questions somebody asked that is very autobiographical in terms of the characters and the setup and all that you know i was in a job where i was having to travel to richmond twice a month uh that was a long drive and who wants to go to Richmond anyway, you know? So, uh, I wrote a book that was about somebody sort of like me who wasn't an expert on anything, but spent a lot of time on the internet and spent a lot of time preparing. Uh, and I took my family members, my friends, my life situation and my neighborhood and put them into this book. And I thought, eh, hey, this is fun, but nobody's ever going to read it. So I, did, I said what I wanted to say and, you know, all that stuff and uh, didn't expect that anybody would ever read it. <clears throat> but the, the character in there is not always a likable guy. Uh, you know, he says a lot of things that may so be autobiographical. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's, that's the point. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, he still uh, does everything he does out of, concern for his family and uh you know the people around him and i i think that in the end that's that's kind of what you got to do is you've got to do what's right for your family and your your setting wherever that is and uh you know to a certain extent you have to uh let things outside your sphere of control just go yeah that's that's kind of how my books have been focused too i don't i don't have you know scenes where there's meetings in the white house and stuff like that it's all who's who's your neighbor inter interacting with the people that you're interacting with on a local level and your, yours yours is very similar to that too I mean, you had you had some narration of the big pictures to paint the picture for the reader but for the most part 
the readers saw what the characters saw. And I, I like that style personally because I'm not I'm not a I'm not in the, the CIA. You know, I'm not in the middle of some special some special mission somewhere with some private information. So having the characters being limited to the things that you would know in the real world kind of allows you to I think seek your teeth into the story a little better. Yeah, because and exactly what I had in mind for that was, you know, my grandfather on my dad's side didn't get married until late in life. So he was born in 1895. You know, if he was alive now, 125 year old dude. So, uh, you know, going back to his time when, you know, you had a newspaper that you may get once a month, the government was not part of your everyday life. You know, the government and what was going on in the world was not part of what influenced your decisions. Your decisions were made based on what the people in your town, your community, your neighborhood, and uh, what your neighbors were doing. You weren't concerned about what was happening hundreds of miles away because uh, that was a minimal influence on your daily life. And that's what I saw in those books was uh, in almost all my books, except for the Mad Mix series, which is, you know, a little more fantasy oriented. Uh, you know, you're not influenced by politics because it's gone back to, you know, 17th, 18th century levels, that communication and news. You're not in influenced by politics until it's standing right there in front of you. You know, there's, absolutely. <laughs> there's some situations, you obviously, in your books. Like, going back to the first one, when people had to interact with police that were following out, following out orders. You know, that that was it. That was your only interaction with the government. Man, I wish we could go back to that instead of everybody getting in an uproar about every little tweet, comment, statement, post, whatever that every politician makes. That 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 is something we could should definitely go back to, in my opinion. Which is probably why we write those books too, because in our own minds, we want to go back to that world. So you know what? We just create these environments where we destroy the world that's around us to take us back to that time. Yeah, we're just waiting for the day a politician stands up in Congress with one of our books and says, this is what we need to go back to. This right here <laughs> needs to be the model. Yeah, yeah, I'm still waiting for that to happen. Yeah, or for, for Trump to tweet your book and tell everybody to read it, right? Yeah. <laughs> but see them and they would go back to the tweets again, so it'd be... I sent him a copy because I wanted him to carry it when he was, I sent it during the campaign because I was hoping, you know, it would at least show up in his hand at some point, but it never did. <laughs> hey, you can try. <laughs> so, so what do you got cooking now? When, now that you're, you know, got more time to write, I mean, are, are you cranking them out, you know, as fast as an author with Chinese ghostwriters or, <laughs> or are you... <laughs> Not that fast because I'm actually, you know, having to sit down and type it myself. But, you know, I am writing a lot faster and I was used to keeping real consistent hours at my job. So now I'm keeping those same hours here in my home office writing. So at this point, I've got uh, I've got a thriller that's done and with the editor, I've got a um, new post-apocalyptic series that's about halfway done through the first book and I've got a new Mad Mick going also. So I'm trying to keep two books going at a time. So when all this gets caught up with the editing and the covers, because a lot of that's fallen behind now, my cover designers are, you know, all in quarantine. So they're, you know, uh, <clears throat> they actually live in Serbia. So they're Serbia has martial law now. So everybody's in a, a tough situation of they're trying to work as a company when they're all scattered out. So I expect when everything gets caught up this summer, I'm going to have a pile of books coming out. I think I can write one every other month, so I'm aiming for six books. What about the uh, shape-shifting werewolf book you were telling? Oh, that's a pen <coughs> name. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have mentioned that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sorry, folks. <laughs> Let's get out of the bag on that one. <laughs> hey, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of that stuff makes big money, so there may be <laughs> a day when I'm down to writing, you know, prepper Wear bear shifter romance. <laughs> Sad but true. And you know, if you don't put some dude with no shirt on with you know ripped muscles on the cover, it's not going to sell at all. Yeah, that's the next Mad Mick book. 
<laughs> I dare, I dare you. You, you should do yeah. that. You should do that just as a temporary cover to see what happens. You know, release it with you know the rip, ripped mick on the front, and all you know, oiled down and everything with Fabio hair blowing in the breeze, and then you know maybe a week later it would change the cover, update it just to do it as a joke. But and then the, you know what? If you did that, those initial copies would be like limited edition, you know, collectors. <laughs> copies. I would not be above doing that. <laughs> Do it, man. <laughs> or at <laughs> least as a poster, you know. Because right. I, I know there are some DD12 people who would buy that poster. <laughs> yeah, they're right. You know who you are out there. <laughs> yeah. Don't forget the T-shirt has your Fabio, <coughs> Fabio Mick on the front, you know. That would sell good, too. Um, let's look at some of these questions. You know, the, fir the first person that posted, of course, was Boyd. And he... We kind of just answered that on accident. He says, question for Hort. How are you digging retirement? Are you getting more writing done or no change? Has your honeydew list increased by order of magnitude? Now, the honeydew list we didn't touch on. Now that you're home more, are you being enslaved? Well, you can probably relate to this. Living on a farm, there's always more work than you can do. So most of the projects on my list are things that I wanted to do. I started... Uh, on my shooting range, I started a covered shooting area, a, like a picnic shelter type structure about three years ago, and I hadn't finished it yet. So I'm working on that, and uh, I've got all kinds of little projects. I haven't finished replacing all my fencing because it's all uh, electric fence, and I like woven wire better because it works if there's no electricity. So I'm slowly replacing that. So most of my projects are stuff that I want to do. And I've got a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head with the farm thing. And <coughs> it's never, never, ever, ever a moment of boredom. I've, I can't remember the last time I woke up and thought, what am I going to do today? I'm bored. It's always, oh, my God, of all the stuff I've got to do today, which one can I possibly chip away at? You know, that's, that's more the feeling. There is no time off. Yeah, and when you're in the middle of uh, thinking, well, you know, which of my jobs am I going to tackle? Like your road washes out or a tree falls down or something. So you got something that, uh, you know, draws your immediate attention. Yeah, lately I've been all consumed with getting our, our solar our project done. And I've been, I've been scrambling, running back and forth to hardware stores and trying to compile a pile of every single thing I could possibly need to finish the job. The only thing I can't do with that is a cement truck because <laughs> this ground mount I'm using takes like three and a half yards of cement and I don't really want to mix all that in a hand mixer. Could if I had to, but I'm trying to get everything on property so if we do end up in a Serbian style martial law lockdown, I can still chip away and get my project done. Might need it, you know, who knows. I'd, be, I'd hate to go into an apocalypse with, you know, a massive, <laughs> with this massive solar power off-grid setup that you can't use because it's still... And crazy. 10 feet short of the wire you needed. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. My, my panels are all still in crates from the, from the semi they were delivered on. Uh, I may end up with them just laying on the ground all wired together. Who knows? But, hey, at least it's... Hey, it still better. works. Put cinder blocks under them to adjust the angle. <laughs> exactly. We can rig it. Won't be pretty, but we can rig it. Scott Hunt might shake his head and be like... That's, That's what I was going to say. That is not what I Scott Hunt. <laughs> <laughs> no, we went all out with him. He hooked us up with some good stuff. I, I got to admit, if I didn't let him design it, I would have probably cut corners. I'd have got some jinky pile of crap ground mount because I'd have saved a lot of money and it wouldn't have required cement trucks and all that. But it wouldn't have been, you know, what it's going to be. AliExpress <laughs> solar setup. <laughs> You can buy stuff from there, granted. Can you imagine how long it takes to get all the express packaging right now? <laughs> yeah, and it's going to be decontaminated. Right. So moving on from that, uh, let's see here. There's one. Hey, Franklin, just finished the borrowed world last night. It sucked. No, actually, no, she said it's great. Uh, <laughs> Do you all have southern accents? <laughs> nah. yeah. Not at all. Mm -mm, no. We are completely, completely civilized. There you go, Travis Wade. What do you think about the Maple Syrup Festival this year, on or off? Yeah, probably off would be my guess. Yeah, especially since you don't live in Maine. Um, oh, here's a good one from Mike Sims. Mr. Horton, is it true that you really hang out with Mr. Bird? If so, why? 
<laughs> that, that why is the best part of that question. You, you know, I don't have any idea. <laughs> it's kind of like a meth head. They don't know why they do what they do, right? I, I think it's that hillbilly thing, you know, that hillbillies unite against everywhere else, no matter, you know, where they are. If hillbillies are in the army, if hillbillies are in a bar, if hillbillies are on a construction site in the north, they team up together. Well, we all we are all related, so you know it's like family. Yeah. Uh, you know, a funny note to that is we have been at several events, you know, prepper events. I think it happened in Jacksonville. Uh, it happened in uh, what's that, what Baton Rouge. Yeah, Baton Rouge. It seems like everywhere we go, we always share share tables or at least have our tables co-located so we can just hang out all day because that's really our goal. We've had people ask if we were brothers at every single one of those events. And they're dead serious. And they always ask somebody else off to the side. They're like, are those two brothers? <laughs> so there, there may be something to that. Must share um, too many of the same bad habits. That's the problem. <laughs> Exactly. And Franklin is actually, uh, him and Chris Weatherman were kind of the f first two authors I met in real life. And that was at, you know, Jan's uh, Heritage Life Skills event, you know, back in the day when uh, it, before it kind of has blown up to what it is now. It was just the three of us. That was good times. Not that it is now, but, but, but that's where I met these Way guys. to go, Steve. <laughs> yeah, I didn't mean it that way. But that, that, that's, that's where I first met these guys. And, uh, it wasn't long after that we were going shooting together and stuff. So yeah, we're actually friends outside of Facebook. Believe it or not, people do that sometimes. Oh yeah, we've got together and uh, not long after that and went shooting, right? Yeah, it was right after that. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Oh well, here you you kind of answered this one already from Alan Watkins. Do you base your characters off people you know, or do you make them up? Yeah, I think you kind of already touched on that. That first book, you even had co-workers that you didn't like, and you didn't like them in the book, so they kind of <laughs> knew who they were. Oh, yeah, and uh, people still ask me, you know, that, that person that you killed in the convenience store scene at the beginning of the book had to be somebody you didn't like in real life because they died so quick and so violently and the answer is yes <laughs> but yeah th that book especially but still i base a lot of characters off people i meet in real life sometimes they're composites i'll take one aspect of one person and one aspect of another person and mash them together into a character because it definitely is easier to write a character when you can picture the person and you know how they act you know how they talk you know the way they make decisions i mean that's definitely the way to get characters oh yeah 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 and uh yellow yellow safety glasses guy that's when it comes to mind of course he's a celebrity now yeah he was just on the <laughs> news not too long ago <laughs> yeah. yeah so yeah that happened at heritage life skills too because uh this guy came by and he was kind of an interesting character and i looked at chris and i said he's mine i'm writing a character on that guy <laughs> <laughs> oh, and speaking of that, we've got this dibs thing going, folks. If you walk by our booth and you hear dibs, that may mean we've flagged you as a character because yeah. <laughs> we, 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 we get a lot of the same ideas. So, you know, we'll see an interesting character and we would just, dibs, you know, and that, okay, I've got that one. I'm going to make a character out of him. So if you're ever walking by a booth of ours and you hear that, you, you may just have done something very interesting that's going to get you put into a book. You know, and another thing, too, this is kind of funny. People wonder sometimes how you come up with your names. But at a thrift store one time, I bought this 1967 yearbook from a Texas high school. And I just flipped through that 1967 yearbook and I pick out random names. So almost all my characters are named after somebody who graduated from this high school in Texas in 1967. I thought you were going to say you tracked all those people down and murdered them. That's uh, <laughs> a good serial, serial killer idea. Dibs. dibs, dibs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can have that one, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I got the van already, so I might as well put it to use. You know. Yeah, you pay, do. <laughs> pay insurance on something, don't use it. Um, here's a here's a good question from Chad Rudolph. Back to his gay erotic fantasies. <laughs> what does it feel like to tent cuddle with someone with whom you've officially kindled a bromance? <laughs> I don't answer Chad questions. <laughs> yeah, they don't. They don't go anywhere. They just sorry, goes Chad. Into, goes into a deep dark chasm. <laughs> but, 
Uh, and no, he's never spent the night in the van. Um, all right, Joanne Epperson, here's a good one. You said the coon juice incident in Mad Mick was actually something that happened to someone. I'm wondering, when it happened, did you laugh or end up losing your lunch immediately? <laughs> you know, in a lot of my books, I try to include one scene that's really going to stick with you, not necessarily in the best way, but just a really, really memorable scene. And the coon juice was one of those. <clears throat> and I had a couple of years where I worked construction in Detroit and we got called to this home where these people had a finished basement and one of the ceiling tiles was wet and it was sagged down. So they thought that they may have had a leak upstairs, you know, coming from a toilet or something that was filling this ceiling tile with water. So one of the things that you do first to keep from dumping all the water on yourself is you take a Phillips screwdriver or something, and you poke a hole in that wet tile and drain it into a bucket. So my boss climbed up on this ladder and he stuck a Phillips screwdriver into this tile and he didn't know that there was a dead rotted raccoon on top of the tile. So when he poked a hole in the tile and into the raccoon, uh, this maggot filled stream of coon juice splattered in his face and in his mouth and all down his clothes and everything. And it was just nasty. I mean, he was throwing up. It was, I didn't throw up, but I didn't stick around to watch the rest of it. But anyway, a, a raccoon that was probably about 35 pounds drained out a hole that was about this big. <laughs> yeah. You and so you can't, make some of this stuff up if the reality no. is better than fiction. Yeah, so I reused that scene in one of the Mad Mick books when somebody was trying to make themselves throw up on purpose. They recalled this experience they'd once had with coon juice and it did the trick. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go, Joanne. <laughs> that, that's an answer for you. Alright, she asked another one. To date, out of all of your books, which is your favorite? You know, uh, I think that I really like, I like the Mad Mick because it's very different. You know, it's not, it doesn't make an attempt to be a serious prepper book. It's more like a post-apocalyptic adventure, uh, kind of based on a Western. It kind of reads like a Western. It's kind of paced like a Western. Uh, but then those middle borrowed world books, uh, the third, fourth, and fifth books. I wrote those really quickly together and I was just in this groove. And one of the things that I was doing was, uh, <clears throat> you know, I was, right now we're all kind of living a post-apocalyptic adventure, but at the time I was really able to kind of put myself in that world and I would come in and I would put, uh, you know, a radio and a Glock and everything spread out on my desk like I was stopping the experience of the borrowed world to write down what was happening. So I really was trying to put myself in that mode. And, and in those books, it just flowed. So the third, fourth, and fifth of those books are really some of my favorites. Now, I think my storytelling got better as I went along, but those books were just really in the zone. Mm -hmm. My favorite years was, uh, God, why am I going blank all of a sudden? Like, Random hey, Axe. Yes, that one. Because <laughs> I've told you that a thousand times. And one of the things I like about Random Axe so much is that is about as plausible as they come. You know, our, our other scenarios, you know, EMPs, pandemics, well, obviously pandemics are plausible. <laughs> but uh, that one, that one's, that one's, you can picture it happening. If it hasn't happened already and we just don't know about it, you know, that, that's a good one, folks. If you, have, if you haven't Wait. read the Random Axe, yeah, and that whole thing came about because, you know, we all get these friend requests that have the same woman's picture on them. And, you know, I've probably got 500 or 1,000 friend requests with some crazy name on them, but the picture is the same girl. So I, it made me start thinking, well, you know, who is this girl? And what if she's out there alive and doesn't know that she's on, you know, 10,000 friend requests every day? You know, so I wrote a story around those friend requests and i really like that book too i think it turned out really well <clears throat> and the book that i'm my next release is going to be a thriller also so i think it's going to be kind of interesting it's not post-apocalyptic at all it's just a, a straight up action crime thriller kind of along those same lines 
you know, random acts may not be post-apocalyptic in the traditional sense, but it's personally apocalyptic. You know, that person was was living through an apocalypse. So, uh, and, and, and you know, that situation could could lead to a lot more too. But so, if you haven't read that book, folks, I, I recommend you check it out because it's it may not be his his standard fare, but it's that's uh, that's a mainstream movie quality book in my opinion. Hey, I think so too. I'm just waiting for the people to show up. Where are they? I mean, I mean, it'd be a B-rated movie, but still, man. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, uh, I remember you telling me that you kind of broke it off with little Debbie. Do you think you're riding his chain since you got rid of her? <laughs> or, or have you since broken down and succumbed to her sweet feminine wiles? A.K.A. Oatmeal, oatmeal pie. That's what you call her, your oatmeal pie. You know, it was a lot easier to eat those when I was um, running around all day at my job. But now that I'm sitting down more at my computer each day, I cannot, I've had to say no. Uh, I can't be, you know, I can't be eating those and sitting at the computer writing all day. <laughs> or none of my, uh, none of my gear is going to fit. <laughs> There's only so <laughs> many extensions you can add to your battle belt <laughs> before it becomes, you know, like a toe strap. You'll be one of those, you'll be one of those uh, tactical McDonald's memes, you know, before you know it. Yeah, I'd have to re replace my belt with a ratchet strap. <laughs> hey, at least you'll survive a famine. Uh, when you met Chris and Steven, which one, which one of them made you stop and think, man, he can get me into a lot of trouble? If both, then which one has gotten you into more trouble? Now... Chris has never tried to get you to jump off a drawbridge. So I, yeah. <laughs> probably, yeah, there was no doubt a little... that the answer to this one was you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you folks have you ever heard us mention the drawbridge scene, it's real. That was, yeah. that was real. Chris always has an adventure going on. So, you know, when you're with Chris, there is just always something happening. So it's easy to get sucked into whatever's going on because they're always, you know, people coming through and people coming by and all that but you know you and i have had some adventures <laughs> in jacksonville <laughs> <more> advent yeah <laughs> those adventures may not have ever gotten written down it may have just been a morgue story about a body that floats up you know 50 miles <laughs> down the river but you know that was uh from the very beginning you know from the very moment we had to climb up and onto the bridge because we couldn't find the footpath to get on the sidewalk should have been a big red flag that you shouldn't be on this walkway yeah and and, and walk and going through the homeless camp and you know. <laughs> yeah. i still think the drawbridge idea would have worked now we'll never know yeah, that, that was a challenge. Every moment of that was a challenge. <laughs> In a nutshell, folks, they had raised the drawbridge. We needed to get to the other side, and I was positive we could make it. <laughs> Even though it was raised. <laughs> <laughs> right, we could make it. Up. I've watched the movie. I've seen how that seemed. There wasn't enough of a running head start that you could have got <laughs> to bridge that gap. <laughs> well, now we'll never know, will we? Yeah, especially since there were entire crews there in trucks with flashing lights, you know. I figured the cops were going to come get you. Hey, at least they wouldn't have been far away. <laughs> it's one of those days where the next day you're like, did we really, did that really, did I try to? Yeah, you uh, did. After, after the three monsters and the bottle of aspirin. Uh, Johnny Jacks was with us that night. He didn't stick around for that. He was the most well-behaved of the three. <laughs> He's he's a, a true gentleman, that's for sure. I don't know why he's around us. Uh, you know, this one's funny because last night we had some technical difficulties. Um, long story, but we were going to do this last night, and uh, so we had to postpone it to this morning. And I needed to do it this morning instead of tonight for some uh, scheduling reasons. And he said, uh, "Oh man, this ain't going to be half as funny if we're not drunk." Because I don't have to go to work, so I can't. <laughs> So here's here's a perfect comment. Joanne, she said, can we make sure he's good and drunk for this? If we get him drunk enough, maybe we can get that Scottish accent out of him. What, what's the story with the Scottish accent? Uh, some people want to hear Mad Mick read in his native accent. 
I can't manage that. <laughs> but that doesn't mean people <laughs> don't request it. I have a hard enough doing my own language, much less trying to throw other people. Well, I know for it. hillbillies, English is a second language anyway, you know, so it's not like I can master a third. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm bilingual. I speak American and, and redneck. Um, so, yeah, so anyway, he was massively disappointed last night when we were going to do it in the morning. He's like, oh, I was like, hey, you can have mimosas. Because uh, he looks like a mimosa kind of guy. He? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Bloody Mary would be more like it. So Paul Hendrickson asked, now that you're retired from your day job, what hobby would you like to pick up or skill would you like to learn? You know, Paul and I have talked about this a little bit because uh, <clears throat> I've always been fascinated by machinists, you know, being able to make precision stuff because, you know, I kind of take the redneck approach a lot of times that you hammer and you bash and you put big ugly welds on stuff, but, you know. Grind it, grind it with a hand. Yeah, machinists are so precise. And then, you know, when you have farm equipment and machines and all that stuff, parts can eat you up. So, uh, you know, I've always thought, well, you know, if I could get a metal lathe, I could make some of these parts myself. They'd be a lot cheaper. So that was my retirement gift to myself. I bought a 1950 uh, metal lathe, and I've been teaching myself, you know, how to make stuff. So <clears throat> that's been pretty fun. And Paul, now Paul is the precision guy. You know, I've toured Paul's factory down there and I've seen the bullet factory and I've seen the, the other things he does. And man, that guy is on top of it. <laughs> Very impressive other setup. Other things. Yeah. <laughs> the other things he does. The stuff you do not speak of. <laughs> it, it's too complex for me to even understand. <laughs> I know they make Black medical ops. devices and some other stuff, but you know, it's, you know, it's complicated. I just love how he makes medical devices that save people from trauma, and he makes bullets. So he creates the wound and then helps keep them alive afterwards. It's, you know, hey, it saves it's our guys, sense. kills the bad guys. <laughs> right. <laughs> Working on both ends. Um, see, you're going to have to do that accent, because Shannon Fuller says, Will you please <coughs> read your favorite line from any of the Mad Mick books in Connor's voice? Uh, yeah, when we do this at night sometime... Uh, <laughs> it'll be like story hour with franklin <laughs> and i'll do that after drinking scotch to go with the scottish accent right uh jameson to do the irish accent <laughs> oh yeah yeah um good shit either way so you're not gonna do it huh you're gonna let him down you're not gonna do the accent nope <laughs> <That's> <laughs> not at nine more nine in the morning while drinking coffee it just doesn't work it could have been Irish coffee, at least. Oh, yeah, it's too late now. <laughs> uh, um, let's see. From Gwen Johnson Koshkinen. Sorry if I murdered that. <laughs> hillbilly. Hillbilly. Literate hillbilly. Um, I remember that Horton talked a lot about power companies in his last borrowed world books. I saw an article yesterday. Please don't ask for the link. I've tried to find it, but couldn't. It said that a couple of huge power companies were looking into contingency plans for the virus progressing. The article stated that they were stockpiling folding beds, mats, and food to keep critical employees at plants, housing, living there. They would even they were even considering quarantining teams so they could have healthy people to keep at the plants. What do you think the virus will do to the power grid if it takes off? and we get a possible 70 to 80 percent infection rate like they saw or like they say we may get well i'm definitely no expert on that but <clears throat> my opinion is they can keep the power running because it takes so few people for the most part to keep the the power generation going but where your problem is going to become is if lines go down and components get oh, yeah. damaged because repairs you know i don't know if you've ever watched the power company repair things before but you have the people that repair it and then you sometimes have a crew that comes and supervises the repair with binoculars to make sure it's done safely so it seems like you know it's you know it takes 10 guys sometimes to fix anything so that's where your shortfall is going to come in is not in the generation of power but if things start tearing up it's going to take longer to fix Right, yeah, because those guys are going to have to get out into the infected community. Yep. <clears throat> I 
you can't quarantine them. You know, so you, it would be like a sci-fi movie to see guys in like total ha hazmat suits, you know, cl climbing up a power pole. <laughs> Yeah, with all the splinters on that pole, there's going to be breaches in that suit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, from Joe Trot. Joe Trot's an awesome guy. We see him all the time on all oh, these yeah. events. Uh, he says, you're a gadget guy. Keep it to $100. What are a few of the most appreciated such gadgets you would recommend to others? Well, I tell you what. I, I think the, the biggest lesson between when I started kind of on this prepper journey and where I am now is learning to buy good flashlights because I can't tell you how many cheap, wow, these flashlights are three for five bucks, you know, used to buy those things <laughs> yeah. and then they tear up before the battery even runs down. So after a while I figured out, you know, it was worth it to buy a stream light or a better flashlight, you know, because some of those will last forever. These others, you know, that you spend five bucks on, 10 bucks, whatever, you drop them and it tears up a circuit in there. It chips a solder joint, you know, something goes bad in it and you end up throwing it away. So it's worth it to buy a good flashlight. Probably the other thing is uh, <clears throat> some type of water filtration device, because, you know, if if you've done any hiking or backpacking or whatever, you know, I've drank out of some of the nastiest water in the world, uh, or at least my part of the world just to see how well my filter worked and i've used i've got a steri pen which is the little uv light that you spin in your water bottle and i've got a live straw and i've i've used um, uh, the katahdin uh, hiker filter which is one of the pump filters and i've drank out of nasty mud puddles with that thing and it takes everything out the water still tastes like rotted leaves but at least it's clean and you know it's going to keep you alive it's tea that well, you know, I learned <laughs> after drinking water from mud puddles that tasted like rotted leaves to always carry like some kind of flavor packets in my backpack and stuff, because then it can make you drink more of that nasty water, you know, to keep from getting dehydrated. Yeah, I can second both of those ideas. We recently had a uh, a night. I'm mean, a church. Our church has a security team, and we use my shooting range for the training grounds because you can't you can't do tactical stuff in indoor ranges you know so we'll have you know 20 30 folks out here for a training evolution and we did a night fall lately because a lot of times especially if the lights are off in the sanctuary and it's all dark you know we may may have a need for low light shooting so uh, it was to train people who have never operated tactically before how to use uh, flashlights in conjunction with their guns right and you had some guys that had the, the high-end you know, high-end stuff, you know, $100 flashlights, $200 flashlights, and then you had the Amazon $19 flashlights. And let me tell you, there was a huge, huge difference. I was just functioning as a safety officer and just part of the, the training cadre, but I was, you know, standing back observing during a lot of that, and, man, I, I could tell who had what light, you know, from 15, 20 yards away in the background. You know, it was, it was night and day and the cheap lights just didn't get the job done. So reliability aside, straight up performance is also a big issue. And on your filter comment, I do a lot of hiking as well. And I've got to the point where, you know, most hiking trails, especially if you're in the Rockies or, or something like that, they follow streams because that's, that's the path through the mountains. So there's usually a lot of places where you can top off your water and you can save a lot of weight in your pack if you just carry those filters and just get your water naturally as you go. And I've had a, I had a Sawyer filter basically save my life around Tahoe once. We did a ridiculous trail that was, uh, even the locals wouldn't do it. And we couldn't figure out why until afterwards. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, was, I was absolutely positive I wasn't long for the world if I didn't finally find water. And when we did, it was some muddy water just seeping out of a dried up little creek bed. It wasn't even a puddle. So we had to... Uh, you know, with the saw you squeeze through, so it's kind of like that pump. But we got enough water out of that to keep going. So I'm, I'm absolutely sold on those things. I completely agree with you on that. Yeah, if you've never been dehydrated, you don't realize that everything starts to shut down. It's not like just a matter of being able to tough through it. Your brain quits working and your muscles quit working. So you know, you you're yeah. toast. Right. Yeah. It's it's not a, a matter of will. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like a car running running out of gas. No matter how hard you want to get there, it ain't gonna go. 
Here's a question. I think we've uh, answered it in the very opening discussion. Um, is there a character in any of your books that closely mirrors Franklin Horton? If so, what character? That would be the video game kid in <laughs> Random Max. <Mouse. laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that guy was interesting, and I have met people like that before. Um uh, whose entire world is the video games that they play, you know, but, uh, no Jim in the borrowed world, because at the time I wrote that, I thought, well, you know, and this is one thing not everybody knows, but you know, I, I start, I wrote my first novel when I was like 22 years old and I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. And it was a different experience then because without, the ability to publish through Amazon, what we always had to do years ago was you submitted to an agent and you waited on a response, you know, and it took forever. And I wrote six complete novels over like 20 years that I never could get published. So finally what happened is I started reading post-apocalyptic stuff. Some of the early things like I'd read Chris's book, I'd read, uh, you know, um, 299 days and some of these, these other books that came out around that same time and thought, you know, this is what I want to write. These are the kind of books I like reading. So this, this is what I'm going to put my effort into. And so I just started writing one about, uh, you know, my own life, my own level of preparation. Uh, and, you know, a lot of us were really influenced by Katrina. I, I know that me personally watching those business travelers in the Superdome at a time when I was traveling a lot for business, I thought, I don't want to be that sucker standing there in my briefcase, you know, with dead bodies around me and, you know, not having any backup plan. So, you know, I, I wrote a book about what my plan was. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I think a lot of us kind of got, got started that way. If you look at you know, my last layover, that was about an airline pilot, you know, who had, had traveled for, obviously, as an airline guy traveling for a living. And in, in Chris's <clears throat> Chris's first book, you know, that, that was kind of the same mm -hmm. thing, too, you know. And uh, so a lot of our real-world fears not only drove us to this genre, but drove our uh, stories, or at least our, our first set of stories. And beyond that, you got to, like, be a little worried, but, uh, <laughs> but so yeah if you want to figure out who an author thinks they are look at the main character in their very first yeah movie. absolutely absolutely <laughs> you know, that 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 you know you could you could probably pick me out in in, in mine as well but uh yeah because by the time i got to the mad mick i was no longer writing about myself but you know the mad mick in some ways is the person that a lot of us would like to be because he's hyper prepared. He's prepared in a way that no normal person could ever be. But, uh, you know, he just has this casual attitude about everything and everything is an adventure to him. Every day is an adventure and he's a fun character, but he's not a realistic prepper character. He's like, you know, I don't know what you'd call him, but he's, he's his own little guy having his own adventure in his own world. <clears throat> awesome i may have to check that one out i i you know as well you know, i've said this to people all the time is i avoid the genre because we can't even sit around a campfire and, and have a drink without <laughs> saying stuff that you're like oh great now i can't use that idea because he'll think i ripped it off of him we, we you know a lot of us think a lot alike obviously so if i read his book and he used a particular subject or topic or something it's, it'll feel taboo for me to to write the same thing because it'll, it'll look like or i'll at least feel like inside that i'm plagiarizing so i just i keep blinders on and when i do audiobooks which is the only way i can read now because i'm so busy i stick with westerns and and, and stuff like that because we all I, the last thing we want to do is feel like we're drawn from somebody else's style but you know we've had some good ideas come out of those sessions you know we've talked before about having somebody to take notes and you know write it all down so we'd actually remember <laughs> yeah. it the next day yeah. <laughs> yeah. the campfire if we had a, a scribe we need a scribe around the campfire absolutely sober somebody to take While minutes throw this throw this stuff out and then you know put out this uh, but we, we've had some killer ones just laugh until we're sore and in the next day we're like what was that about <laughs> <laughs> I'm, telling, I'm telling how many hit hit books never never made it through our memory fog. 
Yeah, but we're hanging on to that idea because there might be a day when it actually materializes. <laughs> exactly. I'd, I hope it does. It'd be fun. It'd be fun just producing it. Um, so I believe we've ran through most of the questions. Um, do you see any on there that I missed that you want to answer? Uh, no, I don't. Yeah, we don't want to answer any of Chad's. <laughs> yeah. so. Delete, delete, hide, comment. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <Yeah>. Chad. <laughs> oh, man, I was scrolling. I accidentally went off that post, and I see that, that woman in the gimps, the little patent leather gimp suit with the gas mask on at the grocery <laughs> store <laughs> from Tom Bobak. <laughs> <laughs> you beat that. I know. <laughs> He had that picture already for a reason, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hope you folks enjoyed this, and I hope this really recorded. You know, I'm, a, I'm kind of a rookie at this, and we're going to probably wrap this up, and I'll be like, oh, it's, it's gone, it's not there. You were supposed to push the red button. <laughs> Right. I see the little pause button down in the corner, and I see the little lights jumping up and down from the sound, so I assume that's in there, but... He's he's being my guinea pig, you know, as far as as far as doing this guy. Hey, what are friends you know? for? <laughs> That's right. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, and uh, if if the world ever recovers enough to have some more shows like Heritage Life Skills, you know, come hang out for real, and we'll we'll have these discussions in a slightly more lively manner. And you might become a character. Yeah. <laughs> Not that we're encouraging you to act all weird or anything, but if you do act weird, you may end up as a character. <laughs> exactly. Hey, be, just be yourself. <laughs> Truth is better than fiction. Well, uh, I guess that's about it then. Thanks for your time, everybody. Th uh, thanks for uh, showing up this morning. Uh, you don't seem to be too hungover. Good job with that. <laughs> <laughs> it was a struggle. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. And uh, well, look forward to uh, seeing you again when all this crap's over and we don't got to worry about infecting each other. Yeah, yeah, we could meet at the range and shoot from six feet apart. Right. And Paul did say he had some more stuff he wanted to play with. So Hey, I'm all about it. That would be a perfect uh, thing to do this summer. Probably when you need, like, your solar panels lifted into place or something. <laughs> so you need extra <laughs> hands. You plan a, a shoot and cook out. That that'll work. Or if I end up having to do the uh, the bags of concrete, so then I have to do about 350 80 pound bags. I might could do some people over for that, you know. But hopefully, I can get a, a truck at least close enough to use a Georgia buggy for. But but now we definitely got to do that again. Can't wait for this stuff to be over. In the meantime, folks, be good to each other. Stop tearing each other apart online. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> all these people you interact all these people you interact with are supposed to be your assets. You know, let's not let's not create little rifts over over differences of opinions. So, well, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, sign off for now. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks Franklin for showing up. And uh, we will uh, 